It's a particular pleasure to be here because uh, it's the first time I've talked in archaeology, I think, except um, many years ago. And it's, uh, I've recently been studying the history of archaeology and uh, the uh, university and come across the great work of Dorothy Garrett and that she was the first woman professor in this university. So it's a great honour to be in this seminar named after her. Uh, my talk, Enchanted Landscapes, Reflections on the Fall of Japan and Cambridge, is very autobiographical. I mean, reflective mood, not, um, not merely because it's St. Valentine's Day, but also because I'm coming towards the end of my time in Cambridge after many years. And so I want to take you on a journey through Enchanted Lands. <coughs> I'd like to start by asking what is enchantment and why I'm interested in it by way of this autobiography, starting in Assam on the borders of Burma um, and the Naga Hills and ending in Cambridge here now, by way of Oxford, Nepal and Japan. I was born in Assam on the edge of the Naga Hills, a sort of Kipling-esque world of ayahs, magic, strange birds and flowers. This has always remained with me as a background of a remembered, enchanted world, especially comforting during bleak boarding school days of uh, education and separation from my parents who went back to their the tea estates two and a half years. I was later sustained in my interest in enchanted landscapes by the chance of spending my formative years from the age of 12 to 25 in um, Esthwaite Dale, Hawkshead, near Hawkshead, where William Wordsworth was at school. And I loved Wordsworth's poet, poetry as I wandered around as a child late child and early adolescent there. And the mention of Wordsworth reminds me to begin to sketch in what I mean by enchantment. It's partly the longing that you find in Wordsworth poetry. I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his reeded horn. It's a central theme of Wordsworth's poetry, as you probably know, that the ch enchantment of childhood fades away and we end up um, within the commonplace world that we inhabit later on. This is captured in one of my favourite poems when I was at that age, um, the Ode Intimation to the Immortality, which starts, there was a time when meadow, grove and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore. Turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. The lament of Wordsworth, Blake, Shelley, Keats and others of the Romantics that general disassociation of sensibility, which T.S. Eliot named, all <coughs> rang very true as I grew up. I began to feel that separation of the head and the heart, the retreat of magic and meaning, the disappearance of God, the development of adulthood and coming to terms with a modern world which is divided into spheres of action, politics, religion, society and economy. The glimmers in poetry were crystallised and made articulate when I studied at Oxford. There, as a historian, I learnt the familiar Weberian story about the disenchantment of the world, a phrase from Schiller. Puritanism was just the last phase in the driving out of magic and meaning from this world, as Weber himself wrote in the Protestant Ethic. That great historic process in the development of religions, the elimination of magic, from the world which had begun with the old Hebrew prophets and in conjunction with Hellenistic scientific thought had repudiated all magical means to salvation as superstition and sin came here to its logical conclusion. The genuine Puritan even rejected all signs of religious ceremony at the grave and buried his nearest and dearest without song or ritual in order that no superstition, no trust in the effects of magical and sacramental forces on salvation should creep in. Disenchantment, I gather, in the German, as Schiller used it, uh, 
means the driving out of magic from things, and that's quite what I mean. And it is the central theme of Weber. It's what he thinks, in the words of Reinhard Bendix in his book on Weber, this disenchantment of the world was regarded by Weber as the distinguishing peculiarity of Western culture. This is what is at the heart of Weber. A world, the world had once been filled with magic, enchantment, miracles, and then, particularly as a result of the scientific revolution, this had drained away. A Protestant god, Newtonian science, and Cartesian philosophy had destroyed the interconnections and made the world an empty machine. To put in one lovely metaphor by Thomas Hobbes, the first cannonball of the Civil War killed the last fairy. It was only some years later that I encountered the work of Ernest Gellner, who became my friend and the William Wise Professor before Marilyn Strathern here at Cambridge. He was the great successor in some ways to Weber, a wonderful man. He wrote, Max Weber is the sociologist of rationality and disenchantment. Strictly speaking, there is no and. We have not here two themes, but one. Rationality and disenchantment are intimately connected. A rule-bound society, bureaucracy, and a rule-bound nature are bound to be disenchanted simply in virtue of being ruled down. Enchantment works through idiosyncrasy, uniqueness, spontaneity, a magic which is tied to the identity and individuality of the participants, and all these are excluded by orderly regularity. And rationality is in the end closely connected with regularity. Having discovered that this was my fate, and that what I was experiencing at university was a general theme in the development of civilizations, I became very interested in how it had happened, what had happened to the West to make it disenchanted. So I did my doctoral thesis at Oxford, my DPhil, on the decline of enchantment in the specific form of a thesis on witchcraft beliefs in England, which declined over the Tudor and Stuart period I was looking at. I was enormously fortunate to be the first student of one of the greatest historians of the 20th century, Keith Thomas, who was simultaneously writing his great book on this precise subject, whose title encapsulates the problem I'm addressing. It was called Religion and the Decline of Magic. Keith also pursued this in his second major book, Man and the Natural World, where he explains that in place of a natural world, redolent with human analogy and symbolic meaning, and sensitive to man's behavior, they, that's the 17th century philosophers, constructed a detached national scene to be viewed and studied from the inside, as if peering through a window. You look out, separated off from nature. When I was studying these things at university at the postgraduate level, in the 60s, I wasn't aware that Weber's greatest student, the only person who is allegedly, uh, was allegedly able to have very long, intense, and equal discussions with Max Weber towards the end of his life, that is Karl Jaspers, had put forward a short account of the two philosophical transformations which lay behind this great shift from an enchanted and magical world to the prosaic one which I believed I was growing up into. The first shift was the Axial Age. Jaspers calls it the Axial Age because it's like a wheel turning on its axis. This is the Axial Age of the great religious and philosophical thinkers from the 8th to the 2nd century BC. As Jaspers put it in The Origins and Girl of History, a wonderful book, in this age were born the fundamental categories within which we still think today and the beginnings of the world religions by which human beings still live were created. The step into universality was taken in every sense. And again, it would seem that this axis of history is to be found in the period around 500 BC, in the spiritual process which, that occurred between 800 and 200 BC, 
It is there that we discover that, sorry, that we meet with the most deep cut dividing line in history. Man as we know him today came into being. For short, we may call this the axial age or period. And that's the end of the quotation. Before this axial age, the natural and the supernatural worlds were entangled with each other, not seen as in contradiction or opposition. As in most tribal religions, the world of spirit was largely a reflection of this world and intermingled with it. Humans and animals, this life and the afterlife, were blended together. This is often a world of shamanism and witchcraft, of animism, material things have spirit in them, and of attempts to put pressure on spirits through sacrifice and magical spells. The divine world is not a separate ideal order against which we measure this life, but a continuation of the sensory world in an invisible form. Now, for reasons as yet unexplained, in much of Europe and Asia, over a period of 600 years, a number of great religious and philosophical figures emerged who changed this. They created a dynamic tension between this world of matter and another world of spirit. They set up ideals against which our behavior should be judged. New philosophical systems provided a reorganized relation between a god or ideal system and this corrupted world. In China, this happened in the works of Lao Tse and Confucius. In India, in the Upanishads and the teachings of the Buddha. In Iran, with Zarathustra or Zoroastra. In the Middle East, in the books of the great Old Testament prophets, including Elijah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. In Greece, in the fount of Western thought, in Heraclitus, Homer, Plato, and others. So China found its Confucian template by which it has lived ever since. Much of India and Central Asia, its Buddhist salvation. In the western end of the continent, the firm foundations of the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which were to dominate that world, combined with Greek philosophy. <coughs> this was the first axial age. The second aftershock of it, the refinement and final outcome, occurred about 2,000 years later, with the religious and scientific revolutions of the 16th and 17th centuries. This took the opposition and distinctions of the first separation to their ultimate conclusion. The radical dissociation of the natural and supernatural worlds, which was at the heart of Protestantism, was combined with the separations which are associated with Descartes and the 17th century scientific revolution. This disenchantment of the world is the separation of this human world based on discoverable natural laws of physics and chemistry from the spiritual world, which is somewhere else. It is the end of the mixing of natural and supernatural of the world of miracles and magic. I didn't know all this at the time, and I only discovered Jaspers about 10 years ago. But he was saying, putting uh, all this into a context, which I later came to appreciate. But to return to the journey, I discovered in Oxford, as I began to try to understand witchcraft, that anthropologists have long made a speciality <coughs> of enchanted landscapes, worlds where the separations of modern life have not occurred. That is one meaning of tribal. There are no instituted economies, polities, societies, or religions, but rather a holistic and interpenetrated world. A famous example is the Mausian gift, a material thing and also a spirit of the gift. Another is the Azandi world of mystical inter interpretations or inter interpenetrations. <coughs> it was largely out of a desire to experience a world where enchantment still lingered that made me decide to be an anthropologist, to visit that world on the way in which Levi Strauss so hauntingly writes. I decided to try to return to the enchanted world of my early childhood in Assam, but instead ended up among the gurungs of central Nepal. This was no loss, for by accident I landed in one of the most enchanted shamanic societies on earth. The first surprise, Nepal. The Gurungs have reserved better than any other group 
I know of in the Himalayas and in western China, which I've explored to a certain extent. An ancient form of North Chinese shamanism, tinged with Tibetan Bonpo religion. Their shamans, or Koju, chant and carry out long and complex rituals to localize the forces which invisibly swirl around everywhere. The hills and forests are filled with an array of godlings and ghosts. Even the house has a godling in the fire, another on the shelf in a pot of pure water, and another behind the house. The world is, th <coughs> the world is thick with, dis with enchantment, and the visible material world was just, is just a thin covering for a world of benevolent and malevolent forces. In other words, there are no separations. This is a total society. All relations are symbolic as well as practical, multi-stranded and meaningful. I had found a truly enchanted world when I went there in 1968. After my first extensive fieldwork, I, did return, I didn't return until 1986. But from then on, until the Maoist troubles in 2002, my wife Sarah and I went back almost every year in order to document this extraordinary world as fully as possible because we could see it changing so fast. We created a social history in films <coughs> and documents and watched <coughs> as the shamans in my village um, of Tark moved out and went down to Pukra. But we still found that as we returned, much of the old magical world was retained by other people in the village and moved down into the city of Pukra. Now we are working with Gurung friends to set up a cultural center and Gurung religious center in Pukra, Koimbo. Here, young shamans, paid for by money from uh, the kindness of George Appel in America, are being trained in the old shamanic rituals and myths and in the art of writing down as much as possible and recruiting young people from the hills to carry this tradition on. This study of the Gurungs and the Cultural Centre is particularly nice to mention on this occasion because it is a joint project with Chris here, who carried out a lot of um, field work in this area, up in the high hills from which the Gurungs had descended into the villages I worked in. And the work on the Kola project, which Chris has been organizing, <coughs> will be published soon. So it is a collaboration between archaeologists and anthropologists and people uh, of the culture themselves. Two things have surprised me above all about this encounter. The first is that such a rich and ancient system of enchantment, dating back thousands of years, has been preserved so well for so long in this area. <coughs> the second is the strenuous effort of present-day gurus to maintain this tradition in the face of world religions, capitalism, and a host of other pressures. Even over Christmas, I went to the Guru New Year celebrations, um, and there were 3,000 Gurungs there, and the leading friend of ours, um, the shaman Yajum and his friends, were performing Gurung rituals um, in Reading, uh, and the Gurungs were coming forward and being blessed by their shamanic priests. So everywhere they are, this continues, but particularly in Nepal. So that's one enchanted world. And you may not be surprised, really, to, th to find that an anthropologist goes to a remote part of the Himalayas and finds enchantment of that kind. Perhaps like me, though, you will be more surprised by the next encounter on my journey, which is with Japan and the Japanese. My wife and I went to Japan in 1990, and I returned there every few years. We worked intensively with two Japanese friends, because I don't speak the language and I needed to work with um, people who have become very close colleagues and, in a sense, wrote what I know 
with me. And they wanted to exchange the, my insights on how England works for their inside knowledge of Japan. I went there originally because it seemed to be a, an island which was rather like England. It was a, a true feudal society, it was an island, and it was the first industrial nation in its part of the world. What I expected to find was a very modern, <coughs> disenchanted, industrial urban civilization, similar to the one I thought I'd left in Britain. So, for 15 years, I tried to understand Japan. I wrote about it, I visited it, I read about it. And I tried to place it within the post-Cartesian and Enlightenment categories of Western thought. I took my framework from all the great thinkers, from Montesquieu onwards through to modern social scientists, and I tried to fit this <coughs> apparently huge and highly successful urban civilization of 120 million people within that separated framework of modernity and disenchantment, which I had come to assume was our fate. I tried to look at the economy, the political <coughs> system, the law, the society, the religion, the art, the ideology. But my attempts to understand Japan as a modern, separated, disenchanted world were fruitless. Japan slipped through my nets of understanding. Nothing fitted within those Western categories <coughs> developed out of Greek logic and res Renaissance and Enlightenment philosophy. My formal sociological and historical training shed no light on what I was finding, whether in mysterious cities like Nara and Kyoto, in odd activities like no, kabuki, sumo, tea houses, or even in modern factories, law courts, or universities. Suddenly, while working with my friends in the summer of 2005, I realized that I had mistakenly classified the object of our inquiry. If I stopped imposing my categories and did what I would do as an anthropologist, which is listen to the people within the culture themselves, then something very different emerges. What emerged, as I wrote over a couple of months very quickly, was utterly surprising, an enchanted landscape. The Japanese, as I explain in my recent book, Japan Through the Looking Glass, live behind a magic and largely impenetrable mirror. My friend said, we Japanese can look out through the mirror. You Westerners can't look in to Japan. <coughs> they do not separate off people and things, mind and spirit, reason and emotion. The economy is still largely non-capitalist and embedded, at least half of it in Polanyi's sense. Politics is not a discrete sphere of activity. There is almost no law with a capital L in Japan. There is no such thing as religion with a capital R in Japan. It is in many respects the world that Wordsworth tried to recapture from his childhood. Every Japanese city and park, the mountains and the forests, and even the ultra-modern flats and superstores are simultaneously made of material substances and filled with something else. It's not just obvious things like the Shinto priests present at the opening of a new tunnel or superstore. It's not just the costumes and shrines present in sumo rings or at the headquarters of the Yakuza. It's a deeper, pervasive feeling that there is an undifferentiated mixture of the sacred and the profane in that kind of sense. I can only illustrate this here with one eureka moment in the writing of the book that summer. Kanichi Nakamura, one of my two co-authors, is a professor of international relations, ex-Tokyo Law School alumni, a famous journalist, sometime dean of Hokkaido University, pinstriped, Japanese gentleman, much of the time. He read one of the drafts of my chapters and burst into the tea house we have out at load, saying, Alan, at last I understand myself. I am a shaman. <laughs> what I had stumbled upon, as Alice did when she went through her looking glass, was a mirror world which few Westerners have been allowed to explore. 
It is an enchanted, shamanic and tribal world. Although 150 million urbanites with modern technology and the second largest economy on earth live in this world, they are in many ways like my Gurung friends and possibly descended from the same Siberian shamanic roots. Now this was a shock to me. It immediately led to the question of how this has come about. How have the Japanese managed to avoid the disenchantment of the world? The movement from status to contract, in Maine's terms, Durkheim's anomie, and Marx's alienation, while similar, simultaneously being so very successful on the surface of their lives. <coughs> I have to refer you to the book if you're interested in the detailed answer to this question. But in essence, the reason is simple. When all the great civilizations of Eurasia went through Jasper's axial age and the millennium before Christ's birth, Japan did not do so. In other words, what anthropologists might call the move from tribal religion to the great traditions or religions of the book did not affect the Japanese. Now you might say yes, of course, at that time they, it wouldn't, but what about later? And that is the puzzling thing. Through the next 2,000 years after the birth of Christ, all attempts to introduce the wedge of separations which are behind axiality were resisted and subverted by the Japanese. The first wave was the Chinese wave of the 6th to the 7th to the 9th centuries, the wave of uh, Nara Haiyan civilization. <coughs> They absorbed and then rejected. They absorbed some of it and rejected the axiality. The second Chinese Buddhist wave of the 13th to 15th century, the same thing. Buddhism was converted into the new religions and was different from Chinese Buddhism. The Portuguese Dutch Christian wave of the 16th century temporarily was partly absorbed and then the axiality stripped out of it. The Neo-Confucian Tokugawa wave of the 18th century, the 19th century Meiji European wave, and even the post-Second World War American and Western waves, all of them, like great waves, washed across Japan and then receded and didn't penetrate deep down into the tribal unities which lie at the basis of Japanese civilization. Basically, they did not alter Though they added new harmonies and tones, and I'm changing it to a metaphor, uh, meta uh, sorry, a musical metaphor, they changed the harmonies and the tones on the surface above what the greatest 20th century Japanese uh, philosopher, political philosopher Mariyama Masao, calls the deep note, or basso ostinato, the reverberating deep note of Japanese culture, which has continued, not been changed. Below the surface, like some Miyazaki-like world, and uh, that's a Japanese animated filmmaker who made uh, uh, Spirited Away and films like that. That world of Miyazaki, of strange forces and spirits, which you see in his films, has been preserved as an alternative within this alternative civilization. In its premises and structure, I argue in my book, Japan is almost entirely different, not only from the West, but from China, where I've spent a good deal of time recently. The strangeness that I keep encountering behind the familiar in Japan now makes more sense. I realize that behind that mirror, into which most outsiders look and only see themselves, there is an enchanted world. It's different from, but as rich and strange as that I have experienced in my many visits to the village in Nepal. Now I always, with my students, um, stop after 35 minutes and give them a break for a minute or two, which it, they always in their comments say, that's the best part of the lecture, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. Um, but one needs to relax after hearing something. I was going to use that interval to show you my website but technology has intervened fortunately. <coughs> <coughs>
<coughs> I'll just mention, though, that if uh, I've only <coughs> been able to just get over the surface, if you're interested, if you Google Alan McFarlane, it will take you straight to the top hit, which will be my website, um, or alanmcfarlane.com. If you go onto the front page, um, you'll say, see various things, including some experiments with the use of the internet. If you go to that, you'll see my um, YouTube channel and other things there. On that YouTube channel, there are playlists. <coughs> and there's a playlist called Virtual, Virtual Village in the Himalayas, which has got lots of film about the Himalayas. I'm putting more on, including a film about how to do field work. It's the only film on the web about how you do anthropological field work. And it's taking you to, on a journey to the village and then back again, and what we do there and so on. And there's film of shamanism and all the crafts and arts. There are about 30 films now on that. There are also about 150 bits of film on Japan. There are, in the playlist, there are arts, crafts, different things in Japan, including one which has had a quarter of a million hits, which is a Japanese lady putting on her face makeup one of the top sites in YouTube. Very beautiful, about 25 minutes. So if you want to see <coughs> some of the evidence, and of course on my website are all the writings behind all of this. Then. So if, if anything, <coughs> you think to yourself, I really can't believe that's up on that, you're pulling in my leg, it's a bit much. <laughs> Have a look first at my website and see whether I, that any of that convinces you. Okay, well, that's the interval. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If we <coughs> now come back to the last part, this is called The Surprise of Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> Anthropology is a discipline which acts like a mirror, helping us to see our own culture in a new perspective. The experience of leaving England and Cambridge to work in the Himalayas, Japan, and more recently in China, has altered my own world here in this ancient university. It reminds me of the comment of my six-year-old granddaughter, Lily, when she stepped out of a large wardrobe, once owned by John Maynard Keynes, which is in my room in Kings, which I told her was the entry to Narnia. She, she went in and she and her sister discovered Narnia in there, and after a while said they wanted to come out, and she jumped out of the cupboard at the age of six and looked round and said, the whole world has changed. And this is what anthropology should do. The whole world should change as a result of it. <coughs> it should make the unfamiliar familiar, the overfamiliar unfamiliar. And my experiences in enchanted landscapes in Asia have done that for me. Let me explain very briefly. <coughs> a couple of years ago, I was asked to write a brief preface for a volume of essays celebrating the centenary of the Department of Social Anthropology at Oxford. I was given two weeks and 2,000 words, so I wrote down very quickly what, I, what came to the top of my mind and was quite surprised by the outcome. I started by pointing out that David Hume has noted the greatest problem for anthropologists. Let an object be presented to a man of never so strong natural reason and abilities. If that object be entirely new to him, he will not be able, by the most accurate examination of the sensible qualities, to discover any of its causes or effects. The greater the gap, in other words, in experience, the more the incomprehension. The Oxford philo philosopher R.G. Collingwood also put the problem when he wrote that, though we have no lack of data about Roman religion, our own religious experience is not of such a kind as to qualify us for reconstructing in our own minds what it meant to them. The tribal worlds where anthropologists mainly worked were not separated into institutional spheres and they were without any particular determining infrastructure. There was no polity, economy, religion and society. It's easy enough to acknowledge this intellectually, yet to feel in the blood how such a system works, to get inside it, is difficult. Collingwood advocated, uh, sorry, to get inside in the way Collingwood ad advocated <coughs> is extremely difficult. How could Don's living in what would seem to be the most divided and early institutionalized society on earth, that's in England, have any chance of understanding this in the deep Faberian sense of understanding. 
England, the first large nation on earth to industrialize, and the quintessence of scientific progress with hyper-separations and extreme individualism, seems the most unlikely place from which to launch an expedition to comprehend that other of integrated, embedded pre-Cartesian humanity. And within England, Oxford and Cambridge, and I'll from now on just say Oxford, but Oxford and Cambridge, the home of rational, highly individualistic and idiosyncratic middle-class dons, seems the extreme within the extreme. Yet the reason that we can place Oxford at the forefront of the mapping of tribal worlds seems to be the peculiar nature of Oxford academic culture, and in particular the Oxford and obviously Cambridge collegiate systems. This provided a lived experience of tribal life, of integration and non-separation. One central feature of the tribal societies which were illuminated by Oxford anthropologists was their corporate nature, corporate in the technical legal sense of a corporation. Evans Pritchard and his contemporaries and successors were able to transfer the abstract armchair insights of the great Victorian thinkers from Morgan and Main and later Durkheim to their field ethnographies because they knew what it was like to live in a working corporation. The accounts of Nua, Dinka, or other kinship systems, with their mixture of blood and fictional ties, based on a dual continuation of an entity through time, is almost identical to an Oxford college. Instead of cattle and women, the corporate property consists of buildings, lawns, libraries, and wine cellars. The idea of corporate existence in fellowship, <coughs> with its feeling of continuity and shared participation in a larger, co-owned, whole was familiar enough to them. Such a lived experience is rare in the West, normally only to be found in other bounded communities such as monasteries or other total institutions. Hence some of the most insightful studies of the workings of lineages and the group nature of marriage comes out of an experience of how corporate groups work. The embeddedness of social relations in a multifunctioning whole which is simultaneously an economy, a polity, a ritual unit, and an intellectual world, made it possible to grasp something as unfamiliar as African or Pacific lineage systems. It was true of both worlds, Oxbridge and the worlds they went to, that custom is king, and that and these sorry, and those multi-stranded interpersonal relations based on inclusion and exclusion form the infrastructure. Just as I find it easy to explain to visitors from China or Nepal how my college in Cambridge works by analogy to what I have seen in those places, so when the, the Oxford anthropologist travelled imaginatively into other seemingly remote worlds, in fact, much of it was familiar. It was the same in trying to understand tribal power. I remember Evans Pritchard telling me when he, he first laid out at the Malinowski seminar the workings of the balanced oppositions and mutual tensions which held an acephalous, that's a headless society, like the Nua together, Malinowski said it could not work and was furious. Indeed, looked at from the centralised hierarchical model which the London School of Economics has represented, it was indeed impossible to feel how this could be possible. Yet the integration through factional oppositions, through fission and fusion, through feud and balanced pressures, which is characteristics of societies without the state, is also the key to university and college politics in Oxbridge. The head of house is like the famous leopard skin chief, with some authority, but little or no power. There is no police force, army, and courts of law. Everyone who has been elected is equal in the democracy of the fellowship. Nevertheless, the college does not tend to fall to bits but usually coheres into an extremely effective scholarly unit through the political mechanisms which Evans Pritchard, Fortis and others described. Rivalries, micro-alliances and occasional use of brokers and adjudicators similar to the saints in the nomadic societies that Ernest Gellner wrote about maintain order in an apparently almost effortless way. An Oxford College is the perfect tribe, riven internally with half-hidden tensions yet preserved by these very differences and presenting, when faced with an outside threat, a great deal of unity. 
The most difficult of all the tasks facing Western anthropologists, and the area where perhaps Oxford anthropologists have made their greatest contribution, is in the understanding of tribal beliefs. When faced with polytheistic, shamanistic, enchanted and magical worlds, how could the product of 2,000 years of increasing separation and rationalization identify with ideas which have long been overlaid by that mixture of Greek, Christian and scientific rationality? Yet Oxford anthropologists are famous for their pioneering studies of myth, religion, magic and witchcraft in the series of works from Marriott through to Evans Pritchard down to the present. That Oxford itself, and I think Cambridge, is magical is obvious, yet difficult to document. Something I myself experienced as a pupil at a preparatory school in North Oxford, then as an undergraduate and postgraduate in Oxford. As I wandered the city and surrounding countryside with Matthew Arnold's Scholar of Gypsy or Lewis Carroll's Alice books in my hand, I felt the magical lands just on the other side of modernity. As I discovered the Oxford Magical School of Dorothy Sayers, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and their parallel worlds, I did not find it impossible to preserve beside the Western rational divisions a different kind of enchantment. More recently, Philip Pullman and others have set their work in Oxford for similar reasons, and Harry Potter's Hogwarts was filmed in the Great Oxford Hall. It's perhaps no coincidence that R.G. Collingwood's posthumous collection of essays should be called The Philosophy of Enchantment. So Oxford takes magic seriously, and when anthropologists went to lands where magic and witchcraft are so important, they did not dismiss it as irrational nonsense, but spread it out so we can marvel at other worlds and other interconnections. Likewise, Oxford, in a way, is a very religious place. Religions of many kinds, with their accompanying myths and rituals are plenty, have been preserved in a way which is unusual in our society. Oxford is famous both for its high church legacy and its evangelical Christianity, tolerant and almost polytheistic, yet devout and serious. It provided a perfect home for many of the great anthropologists, almost all of them Catholics or Jews, as Evans Pritchard pointed out to me, who have so widened our understanding of religions in tribal societies, <coughs> from Tyler through to Mary Duckett. <coughs> Of course, as with Japan, I want to know why Oxford and Cambridge have this peculiar, holistic, sacred in Durkheim sense feel about them. This intrigues me, and as I come to the end of over 45 years of professional life in Oxford and Cambridge, I am beginning to inquire into this and I'm trying to write down my reflections and notes with the help of my students about what is peculiar about this place and how it works. I'd like to just finally end with three short observations. The first is a, a caveat. In my part one lectures, I write up at the beginning of them, a quotation from Einstein, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. It's difficult. Um, I think I've oversimplified and gone across many complex areas, but I agree with <coughs> Einstein that you should start with the simplicity, or with Sidney Brenner, who is one of the uh, nearly 100 people who are now on my website in the interviews, he was a Nobel Prize winner, worked with Crick, and he feels very strongly you should start with a simple, forceful proposition, even if it's only half the time right, and then you can find out what's wrong with it. So these are simple bold propositions I've put before you, but I have had to oversimplify somewhat, <coughs> and the reservations, caveats, footnotes, appendices, and so on are all on my website. There are many kinds, one of the oversimplifications is that there are many kinds of enchantment which need distinguishing, and I've been talking about them and knocking them. The Gurungs, the Japanese, and Cambridge are enchanted in very different <coughs> ways. Furthermore, it's not a binary matter of enchantment or not enchantment, disenchantment. It's on a continuum. Life is swinging back and forth. I find my own life swings back and forth when I'm with my grandchildren. I live in an enchanted world. When I'm um, watching the nine o'clock news, I may not be uh, in that world. It depends, and the effect of alcohol helps 
<laughs> the second thing is to say that, that I think that the long announced death of enchanted landscapes is premature. If we look at the successful struggles of small groups like the Gurungs, or world civilizations such as Japan, or the pockets of enchantment within all our lives, there is much behind the surface of the supposed triumph of individualism. We notice that uh, capitalism, Cartesianism and science have not entirely triumphed. Weber was too pessimistic, just as he was wrong about the end of religion. He was wrong about the dis disenchantment of the world. The iron cage has not quite closed around us. Finally, as I approach my formal retirement from my chair in Cambridge in <coughs> 18 months' time, I find a certain satisfaction that the journey started, starting from my enchanted childhood in Assam, and then by way of Wordsworth Valley in the Lake District, and then through Oxford, and these worlds should have brought me back to a unity and integration which, in at least certain points of my life, I thought must be sacrificed, but I now realize can be maintained. Thank you very much. <laughs>